pest management is an area that can just absolutely crush you. You know, if, if you've scaled up a farm and you're just rocking and rolling and then Pythium comes through and you don't really know, or one of these root-borne pathogens, they can wipe out a whole farm and you don't even know it. You don't even see it happening. So that hasn't happened to us at this farm yet, but it's happened to me in the laboratory. It's happened to me at the last farm. So it's worth your investment to have someone on the team with a little bit of IPM, uh, with a little bit of pest management. Welcome to the Vertical Farming Podcast, weekly conversations with fascinating CEOs, founders, and ad tech visionaries. Join us every week as we dive deep into the world of vertical farming with your host, Harry Duran. Vertical Farming Podcast Season 2, welcome back. If this is your first time listening, you're in the right place. This is the show where we interview fascinating CEOs and founders of the leading vertical farming companies from around the world. I'm your host, Harry Duran. In case you missed last week's show, I had a great conversation with the co-founders of Babylon Microforms, Alexander Olison and Graham Smith. This week, I speak to Sam Norton, founder of Heron Farms. Heron Farms has a mission to create a sustainable agricultural system and restore the marsh using Earth's most abundant resource, seawater. We talk all about sea beans, Sam's fact-finding mission to Bangladesh to learn more about how seawater crops are grown, and the work Heron Farms is doing with other brands to help rebuild salt marshes across the globe. We learn about Sam's passion for environmental studies and what inspired him to get involved in ag tech, why he chose to focus on seawater agriculture, the startup competition he entered and won. We learn about mentors that have motivated and inspired Sam, and he shares with us the various challenges that he faced when moving to indoor farming. We learn about what was the most interesting part of his trip to Bangladesh, and he shares the tech stack he's utilizing with Heron Farms. Special thanks to our episode sponsor, Series Greenhouse Solutions. If you're looking for a greenhouse solution that will suit your specific climate and growing goals, then talk to an expert from Series Greenhouse Solutions. Series combines passive solar concepts, innovative climate control technologies, and customized grow systems to ensure that their growers are yielding the highest quality product year-round for the lowest operational cost. Visit SeriesGreenhouseSolutions.com, that's spelled C-E-R-E-S, GreenhouseSolutions.com, to learn more. Naturally, I'm curious to learn about the benefits and nutritional value of sea beans as well as marketing challenges with that crop. All in all, a very fascinating conversation, and I learned a lot. If you enjoyed this episode or past episodes, I'd love it if you leave a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. I'd love to read yours out next. This episode is also brought to you by the Vertical Farming Weekly Newsletter. Each week, our team member, Daniel Dre, scours the ends of the earth, climbs mountains and forge rivers to bring you the latest and greatest in the world of vertical farming. Sign up today at verticalfarmingweekly.com. Okay, let's jump into this conversation with Sam. So Sam Norton, founder of Heron Farms, thank you for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Thanks for having me. So uh, I'd like to start off on a high note what's something good that happened to you this week we broke another sales record and my niece turned one so those are both awesome <laughs> can you share the record it's probably pretty low for most of the okay. audience yeah That's okay. but uh, it's good for us we're on our that's our 11th sales cycle our 11th week of sales out of this new facility yeah we're on the right path and for the benefit of the listener where's home for you now charleston south carolina it's, i grew up outside of it and that's where our uh, this first farm is located. What was life like, like growing up for you? It seems okay. You know, it's it's it gets pretty warm down here, but it's pretty beautiful part of the world. I grew up on one of the barrier islands, so a lot of surfing and oh yeah, mostly sports, mostly basketball and football. That was kind of all I knew until I tried. I took a stab at academia. What were you thinking, if you can remember? going that far back, but like when you were in high school, getting ready to, to decide where you wanted to go for college and what you wanted to study, <laughs> what was on your mind back then? Oh gosh. Well, I, I did the, I did exact. my mom told me what I should do, which was to leave the state and to go off and do what she did. And my brother went to university of Hawaii. So he went about as far from Charleston as you could go. Yeah. I decided that wasn't that I was smarter than her and I would just go to college of Charleston and, uh, you no, know, CFC has been great. I'm a grad student there now about to finish. And, uh, but I was thinking out of leaving high school, like, Oh, I'm having so much fun. I'll just stay in this town. And I ended up failing out of school and 
becoming kind of a carpenter vagabond for a while until I got back into school and, and turned things around. That's funny. My partner went to University of Hawaii as well, <laughs> so <laughs> it heard a lot of good things. And and that's actually one of the options for a future place to go temporarily. You never know with what's happening nowadays. My business is remote, sure. so it seems like all options are on the table. Oh, sure. I just bought 17 acres in what's technically middle of nowhere, South Carolina. It's not even incorporated. It's called Green Pond, but it's okay. because this work from home lifestyle that we might move towards that we're kind of forced into recently, but might move towards. Uh, it'd be nice to do it from a beautiful part of the world. And it's certainly nice down there. So Hawaii would be a good choice. Although my brother told me that the it was pretty expensive for a gallon of milk and some of the yeah. necessities. For people that are either unaware of Charleston, how would you describe it? And what's the draw to it? Because it is a beautiful part of the country. And I think for people are, you know, know the big cities and know the popular touristy places. I don't know how many times Charleston comes up in conversations of like great places to live, but how would you describe it to folks? Well, it, gosh, it has just a troubled history. You know, it was the largest slave port in the 19th and 18th century in America. It's because of that city of Charleston had great, great wealth, but it was built on, of course, nonsense. And so, and today it's still a very undiverse place, but it is beautiful in the sense that it's scaled properly. The, the, we were one of the first cities to have a historic district and to have a, a board of architectural review that would not allow the development the historic district. And so that has remained intact. And it's one of the main reasons people come down here to do weddings and things like that. But but more importantly, it's couched in between the Francis Marion National Forest, just to our north, and then the Ace Basin, just to our south. And so both of these protected areas give this place just an incredible greenness to it. And of course, it's sitting out in between these two rivers and marshland all around. And that's been under a bit of pressure since the mid-2000s-ish We've seen quite a bit of development and, and people like my old man that build houses. It's just great news for them. But for the marsh, it's not good news. When did this interest environmental studies click for you? When, when was it something that you started to realize you were being drawn to? Well, I was studying political science as an undergrad. And so when the last administration came into office, it, it kind of felt like an oxymoron. And I, I was sort of drifting at the time towards natural sciences because I had been reading folks like Wendell Berry and uh, E.O. Wilson and people that my professors had turned me on to. And so I just got more and more into, I bought a microscope at one point during undergrad and, and it turned out just like, you know, looking at your compost under the microscope and things like that had its own entertainment value to it because I didn't have social media or TV or anything. So it had a lot of, I could just, that was fun. So anyways, kind of drifted that direction and ended up studying these, these salt tolerant plants and getting into grad school for that field and just kind of running with it. Did you know anyone who was in the industry? Were you starting to make connections or follow people that were doing something similar at the time? Well, sort of in a, in a strange way, I just, I met this woman at Boeing and she was on the biofuel strategy team and she was like, I was studying Middle East politics and she's like, you need to check out what we're doing in the Middle East. You know, we're growing uh, this plant called Salicornia with just nothing but, but salt water. And uh, I just thought that was so fascinating that I wanted to learn more. And anyways, ended up writing my capstone on what they were doing out there and seawater agriculture in general. And the, the takeaway is that the plant that they were growing for biofuel that they were saying would kind of lead the the way or be the corn of seawater agriculture was the same plant that we had eaten growing up around Charleston. It, it was the annual species was, was native. And so I had been eating it growing up and realized like mm. we should grow this for, for food and not fuel. And that's kind of what started it. I do want to set some context for the listener because I just love the sort of like the real worldness of podcasting sometimes. So can you just let the listener know where you are? Because if they do hear background oh, yeah, noise, sure. I actually want to leave it in there because I because I, I think this is what's what's awesome about talking to the, a variety of people in this industry. And then sometimes you're actually calling from the place or dialing in from the place where work is. So maybe set some context for where you're at. Yeah. Now. Uh, sorry, Harry. And for the listeners, I'm Simon. So the- the grow room is, is right behind me. There's And there's uh, about a half dozen people still on site right now who are feeding and kind of cleaning up after a, a, our biggest week so far. And so you might hear a door or two open, and I apologize. That's okay. 
So yeah, so Ed, so that when you had that realization that this plant that you were very familiar with, having grown up with it yourself, could be grown in those environments, was it that immediate? Was that like that light switch went off and you're like, this might be something to look into? It was pretty immediate. And it's because we have in Charleston and in Savannah and in these port cities in the southeast, we inside the port, we have these things called confined disposal facilities. And these are basically large areas of marsh that the Army Corps has turned into confined areas to put dredge material when they deepen the harbor. Telling us that, telling you all that, because we deepen the harbor in Charleston every 10 years to keep up with Savannah in these places. And, it, and it, when you dump a bunch of salt water and mud into a confined area, the, the water evaporates and it leaves behind very salty, desiccated mud. And so we have a very famous one under our big bridge in Charleston called Drum Island. And I was going over the bridge after meeting these folks at Boeing and realized, oh my God, the plant that they're talking about starting the seawater agricultural industry is growing right there naturally. And so that kind of sparked this whole, let's rebuild the confined disposal facilities and grow useful products with seawater. And it turned out you had to decouple those. And, and if you wanted to rebuild confined disposal facilities, you could do it, but you couldn't do it and have it any useful, very many useful products. You could do it and let habitat scale on its own, but it needed to bring the food uh, system elsewhere. And can you talk a little bit about the competition you entered also as well and how that played a part in learning more about this? Oh, gosh. Well, that was just a lot of luck timing because the, the South Carolina Department of Agriculture, we are not the most forward thinking bunch up until the commissioner went to Netherlands and saw some some advances in the industry and, and really wanted to come back and say, listen, guys, we corn and soybean and cotton is, is just fine, but and peaches are just fine too, but let's, uh, let's get it more interesting. And so he tasked a woman named Kyle Player with starting the Acre startup competition. So I entered that with this idea. I was kind of the youngest person there. For some reason, thought it was willing to take a chance on it. So it, it really gave me the runway necessary to just fail over and over again with these plants indoors and outdoors and get the path cleared out for me, at least for a little ways. What I thought was interesting was the fact that you make it a point to have your mission prominently displayed on your website. So can you you know, let the listener know what that is? Because I think it's very audacious and I think it's very inspiring as well. Yeah, it's to tap into the largest resource on the planet, which is seawater. And if we can do that while we rebuild the planet, then that, that's really a, a win-win. But it comes from living in a place like a lot of towns on the coast that are looking at seawater and looking at the next 50 years or a few centuries and saying, oh gosh, better move to Asheville or, or uh, somewhere closer to you. And, and so what we're saying as a company is let's not just treat the seawater that's incoming as a problem, let's treat it as a resource. And so that's where we got our mission mm. from is, is trying to communicate that in as few words as possible. What's interesting is the fact that you're still in school and, and then you've been, you founded Heron in 2018. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And so when did you realize that this was something that in order to be successful, in order to take it to the, to the next level, you'd have to create a company and, and you'd have to figure out a way to scale this up. And, and that's not something that most you know, people, unless they have the entrepreneurial spirit, uh, think of. I've got the spirit, but I don't, you know, I don't have much else. I, what happened was the Acre sent me an email in July of 2018 and said, hey, you won the competition. We're going to wire you this money to your Heron Farms bank account. It didn't exist. Heron Farms was just an <laughs> idea. You know, it, it, it was not a real thing besides something I had made a PowerPoint and done a little bit of research wow. on. So anyways, the business was formed prematurely in order to process the grant, which we ended up, yeah, they allowed me to use it for academic purposes at the time. So the business started in 2018, but uh, that was really the beginning of mostly research until last, basically this time last year when an established hydroponics company, we had just won another startup competition in the area and a, a more established hydroponics company said, okay, man, you can use one of our shipping container farms and just go crazy with it and see what happens. And we ended up selling out of our product despite the pandemic. And so that's when we got enough funding to kind of go off and do our own thing. So the being ready for scale and with the second part of your question, you know, we're, we're like the, we're fixing the car as we drive it down the road type of thing. Um, we have the good kinds of problems, you know, we have more demand than we can grow for. So we're 
we're fixing it as we go and trying to get ready to scale. But at the time it was that they gave the grant, it was just, Hey, go figure this out. And thanks to a lot of help in the area and, and, uh, folks in the industry, we're starting to get there. So where do you look to for inspiration? Because you've got a pretty decent team that you're starting to build up. Who do you look to for guidance when you you try to figure out like, who's the next hire? Like, where do I ask for help? Like, how do I grow this? How do I scale this? What is it that I don't know that I should be asking? I imagine at that point, like you have a lot of unanswered questions. Sure. I've got, so in the, the, in the most recent startup competition, I had a mentor. This gentleman has started two publicly traded companies. He's in his seventies, old school American capitalist, you know, doesn't curse, doesn't, you know, it's just, it's a, he's a great mentor. Anyways, he, after we won, became an investor. And so he wears the investor hat and the mentor hat. We also have another investor I met through him that is a new school Stanford finance guy that is also a great mentor. And so, but they both don't come from ag. And so that sort of inspiration comes, I've up until recently had a member on the team named Brian Evans, who had worked at Plenty and we would just brainstorm all the time. And, and he was a big inspiration. But You know, conversations like this and conversations with the local team, but mostly just sort of random interactions with folks. One person on my team got me to get LinkedIn a few months ago, and that's just led to some just fascinating conversations. I hadn't had social media up until then, so it's really been, that's been interesting. So for inspiration, I would say the internet's full of it, and so are people outside the industry who, who their, whose businesses are going through similar things right now and they can always help even though they have no clue about how halophytes physiologically work would you want to mention any of those mentors or any of the folks that have that helped you there sure Stuart bascom who was, uh, i was talking about he was the mentor in the startup competition and scott fisher who is the other mentor and investor i was talking about also the one of our early investors was the judge of the startup competition his name is patrick bryant he's a software focused uh, investor and entrepreneur in, in the South. But uh, because of LinkedIn and, and podcasts like these, the, the mentor list is, is definitely growing. And that's a lot of fun because people like what we're doing enough to speak honestly when we're just, I'm just messing it up. And so they, a lot of good, honest feedback has been coming in. Is anyone doing anything similar with saltwater, like similar to what Heron is doing? There are, you know, a few dozen folks doing it outdoors in Europe and Asia. There's about to be someone doing it indoors in Europe. I I don't recall the the name. We're, we have some random restaurant customers that we ship to. And so it looks like we're getting a, a few boxes ready to go out the door. Very cool. Yeah, I was just asking if there's any folks doing something similar in this space. Well, I want to back it up, Harry, because there's many people that have been doing it outdoors. And what I realized in grad school, and this is part of the reason for bringing food production indoors with seawater ag, is that we saw four or five major big funder projects outdoors grow salicornia and fail after a couple of years. So I was trying to figure out why they keep failing. And it looks like, it seems like it's been the same three reasons. And those are land constraints. If you want to pump seawater in, you must be near the coast. If you're near the coast, you're very high likelihood that people live there. And they do not want to have a guy from America come in and say, hey, look at all this marginal land. We're going to grow salicornia. It doesn't go over well. This happened in Sonora. It happened in Eritrea. It happened in UAE to some extent. It's kind of the not in my backyard type of thing. So that's one land constraint. So then if you find a place that is near the coast and, and desert, deserted enough to work, you run into the second constraint, which is that if the annual precipitation is less than the annual evaporation, if it just doesn't rain much, you build up sodium chloride in the soil. And even these plants, which are the most salt tolerant terrestrial, can't handle it after a little while. And the third one is just seasonality. These plants flower as the photo period changes in the end of the summer, and there goes your edibility. And so we tried to fix those three issues by bringing it indoors and going vertically. But so the outdoor farms are going to work if their main product is outside the food space. They can make food products in seasonally. But what we're seeing now is more of a push towards raw materials. So there's a so for using the seed oil for pharmaceuticals or for biofuels or for text we're seeing the lignin being processed for biofuels and we're seeing uh, 
folks trying to make use of the basically dead plant matter or an interesting company in Asia who is only interested in the plant salts because when sodium chloride is processed through a halophyte, it decreases, it changes the sodium chloride ratio and makes it healthier for humans, than, healthier than table salt. And so they've, they've won some interesting mm. startup competitions in Asia based on that platform. That's really interesting. And, and I think the idea that you decided to go indoors, did that present its own set of challenges oh, as well? I mean, your listeners know all of them, I'm sure, and more. Because when you look at a company's Instagram, it, it looks very beautiful inside their indoor farm. But, but of course, behind the scenes, there's just all sorts of issues when you try to put nature in a headlock inside of this room and uh, and make it all work. But no, it's the same issues as, as most people. I mean, pumps need to turn on at the appropriate time. Lights need to do their job and, and the electric bill needs to stay in a good space and the room needs to stay cool and your planting cycles need to be really dialed in so that there's no gap weeks because you just promised a customer that you deliver 52 weeks a year and then you 47 doesn't count. And uh, so it's presented all of its plenty of challenges, but we did find one example in the outdoor space where two of the three challenges were solved. And that was in rice paddies that had become salinized due to sea level rise. And so went to Bangladesh last year on the whim that with a guy from Europe that yeah, that would work. And it, kind of does because the land use constraint isn't there it, it because it's already the land is already dedicated to agriculture for rice production but during the non-monsoon season there's no rains and the incoming the irrigation water is too saline for rice and so we had this thought well why don't they just switch crops and grow halophytes like salicornia and a few others and that turned out to work it also solved number two because it would rain in the monsoon season to knock out the sodium chloride and you would not ruin the soil. And so we're going back in March to Bangladesh to try that on a larger scale with different partners. And uh, so that's pretty interesting. And we'll see how that does. Well, that would seem to open up a whole new possibility of partnerships if you get that right and probably get a lot of attention to you and, and, and the work that you're doing, which in my mind, I start to think about like juggling different priorities as well and all the, all the challenges that come with that. But was that your first time out to Bangladesh? First time, yeah, the partner so he owns a company called Seawater Solutions in Europe, and they do strictly outdoor climate resilience marsh replanting for food and, and other. He basically ca called me about a week before and said, hey, do you want to go to Bangladesh? And I had never met him, but ended up, you know, we just had knew each other. Our companies followed each other on Instagram. That was about it. But anyways, I went with them and it was a great time. And we traveled around with the Ministry of Agriculture and tried four pilot sites, which represented the four kind of versions of rice paddy, which had been inundated by salt water and were no longer, we're, we're laying fallow and three of them worked. And so we're going back this year with a, a Dutch partner called ICO and the World Food Program. And of course, the, the ministry again, and you're right, it'd be really interesting if it scales. Uh, it will have likely the, one of the same problems, which is what is the end market if we do grow all these halophytes? Let's say every, the 10 million of, 10 million acres of rice paddy that will be laying fallow next non-monsoon season, what what are we going to do with all those halophytes? And that's that's really what needs to be established before this scales. What was the most eye-opening or interesting thing about your time in Bangladesh? It was pretty awesome. I would say, you know, in Charleston, a lot of land, we do not have very many people in South Carolina compared to how much on, in Bangladesh, every inch of the place, places I went through at least, had been turned into food production. It was incredible. I mean, every inch of someone, you had a rice paddy on the edge of the rice paddy, they were producing tamarind or some tree in the backyard, they were growing shrimp. And in the front yard, there were, there were livestock. And it was just seeing, but so there was that really interesting part where they had learned to grow enough food for so many people. I mean, half the population of the U.S. fits into Bangladesh. And that thing is, the country's the size of South Carolina. The other part of that is, oh gosh, was, this is supposed to be mangroves. Where are the mang you know? So there's some of that as well. But there is, of course, the Sundarbans in southern Bangladesh, which are are untouched. People kind of get in and out, and it's very. You can get a lot of money if you can find a tiger to bring back to the market. But so it's quite beautiful. But so all I'm saying is, 
it was fascinating the food production in that amount of space for that amount of people, but also the destruction of the natural environment was also a bit eye opening. Was there anything that changed your perception from a production standpoint in terms of you know obviously they've demonstrated what is possible, <laughs> at, you know, and anything that you were able to bring back in terms of how you think about what you're trying to do here stateside? I came back with a sense. And you can fly over the Midwest where you are and get the same sense. And there's parts of South Carolina will give you this sense. But I came back with a sense that monocultures really just are a noggin scratcher. They just, they are great on paper. And when you actually implement them, they are just not good at scale across the landscape. It is to see an entire landscape of only rice and to know what was there before. So I'm not, you know, so that's what I came back with, with, with that sense. The other one is, if I can say the second part, it would be that yeah. you can grow your own food. That whole country is learning, you know, besides the folks in Dhaka in the big city. I mean, most of the folks are growing their own food and what's left over is given to or sold at the local market. So you really can have a robust town where everyone grows their own food and supports their growing different things. And so monocultures are scary at scale. But diverse agriculture at a smaller scale is very interesting and seems to be working over there, although it has caused a great loss in the natural environment. That's a nice perspective. Thank you for sharing that. So back with Heron, can you talk a little bit about the technology stack to the extent that you can, that you're using and, and what's working for you right now? We have not gone the route of robotics, so we are, we are trying to learn our tack times through manual labor. And as those tack times reveal themselves and, and things become unscalable or we see things that can scale better with automation, that's that's where that comes in. But the grow room technology is, is fairly standard, I would say. I mean, there's not many in the industry now who are not monitoring and manipulating the environment with auto dosing and with logical controls in the environment. So CO2 and humidity and et cetera are manually controlled during the commissioning phase and then they you automate one at a time but that's our route in terms of well we're, we're using software that allows us to also have our inventory and sales built into that so there's traceability throughout the system so we log into a dashboard and see the environmental parameters of the farm and anything that may have happened but then the la- but then put in a sales order move inventory through the software into uh, cold storage and basically be able to, like most farms that want to have harmonized GAP plus or one of these certifications, be able to trace back in case there was ever an issue. And so in terms of technology that we're working on, so the folks listening to this are dosing their nutrients with conductivity probes, but a conductivity probe doesn't allow you to distinguish between sodium chloride salts and nutrient salts. It all looks like, I mean, if you drop a if you drop a conductivity probe into salt water, you basically break the thing. And so, what we're working on, just a little teaser, is is being able to distinguish those and to be able to dose properly when you add seawater to the equation. You bring up an interesting point because some of this is brand, a lot of this may be brand new in terms of like technologies used, but also what that brings to mind for me is the skill set required for people to operate in these environments. And I don't know to what extent there are people who are being taught or learning the combination of skills you need, you know, to operate in these new new types of vertical farms and, and even some of the things that you're doing that are cutting edge and specifically related to the challenges you have with salt water. So I'm, I'm wondering how you think about those as you start to grow your team. Well, myself and the rest of I have them. I try to do some academic research, but you know, a lot of us are just YouTube university. I mean, that's, you look at, you had Nate story on recently. I mean, if you've got an hour a day to watch Nate or Bruce Bugby or Dr. Kubota at university of Arizona, I mean, you're doing just fine. Yeah, that is uh, Brian Evans used to joke that plenty was hydroponics university and you could spend two years at plenty and then graduate and you would, you would have learned everything you need to know. But so in, in terms of the skill set, what, Brian, I used to joke about, he came up with this term, someone else may have come up with it, called plumtrition. And so if you wanted to be a useful person on a hydroponic farm, you needed to be part plumber, part electrician, and then part, you know, plant scientist, blah, 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 blah. So, no, I think the industry isn't old enough yet to really have 
we have the converts, you know, we have the old school people that came from greenhouses and are now in CEA, but a lot of what we're seeing is at least people my age, you know, they kind of learn from YouTube and then you learn from just trying and they work, they grow one plant in the basement, kill it five times and by the sixth they've eaten it and they are starting to learn. Can you talk a little bit about the benefits and some of the nutritional value and just maybe just a a 101 on sea beans? Because there may be a lot of people that don't understand them, don't know them. And obviously, you growing up with them are very well versed in them. So I think that'd be helpful. Sure. The the first thing is they have salt water in them. They're 98% water and the water grown is salty. So they're like biting in. It's kind of like the plant. It's kind of like an oyster, but in the plant world. So it's like jumping in the ocean a little bit, not quite that salty, but uh, it's delicious. It's the only produce that's already seasoned with salt. And us and the other mammals really like salt. Not too much or we'll be totally offended, but you know, you can shoot a deer down here just by putting out a block of salt. And where you live, elk will get run over because they will come lick the road salt Mm -hmm. off. And there's no species on the planet that doesn't need sodium chloride. And so we have the sort of primal attraction to it in a sense. And I think that just comes from us liking salt and needing it. But nutritionally, it's interesting because in order for a halophyte to live in the marsh, they have to, you know, you remember in bio 101, you learned about water and how water is kind of weak. It just kind of follows ions around. And so halophytes have to change the osmotic gradient. And what that means is they have to hold on to more salts and minerals inside their cells in order to bring the water in from the soil, which in this case is very salty and full of minerals. And so to change, they have to create a gradient where there's, where water wants to enter the cells. And that's why you cannot plant corn in a salty field because the water won't enter the cells of of the corn. And so for that reason, halophytes store more minerals per gram than typical plants. However, they can store a lot of sodium in the vacuole and so it can become unhealthy. And so what our game here is to make them salty enough to taste delicious and salty enough to use as much seawater as possible, but also not too salty to make them unhealthy and make them unpalatable. And so we're trying to match that up. But it's like most plants, vitamin A, calcium iron, it has a profile similar to it's in the same family as spinach and beets. So if it if you had to pick a profile that was most similar, you'd pick spinach. What are other, some other common halophytes that people may not, may not be aware of that fall in that family? This is the goosefoot family. It's called chenopods. There are, I know, if, people, you know, if someone grew up, grew up on the coast, they might be familiar with Batis maritima. It's called saltwort. Most of the halophytes are a little bit obscure. I mean, sea purslane, maybe. It's in a different family. But uh, there's about 1,500 halophytes we know of. and oh. and only a couple dozen you really are being looked at seriously for ag, and only about a dozen of those are pretty serious for food. Salicornia has the longest history of edibility, and that's why, and it's also the most salt tolerant, and it's annual, and so that's why it gets the most attention because it's been eaten on multiple continents for a very long time and, and typically just foraged. And that's how all of our chef customers, you know, occasionally there's one that doesn't know what it is, but typically a chef has used it at some point during its wild harvest season, and uh, they're already familiar with the plant, even though it has all sorts of strange monikers in the U.S. Sea beans is what Whole Foods calls it, which is why we went with that name, but there's a bunch of names for it. Where does seaweed fall in the range of, like, plants that flourish in seawater? Well, they're a macroalgae. They're not, they don't have a vascular system. They don't have a root system. Okay. And so what we're growing are terrestrial angiosperms. And so you would that we get asked this all the time, like, why don't you guys, why are you guys trying to go after this niche market? I mean, just grow a bunch of algae. And it's just, we're set up to grow basically like lettuce or, you know, we're growing a rooted vascular plant. And so, but algaes for good reason are getting a ton of funding and attention because, oh my God, you can grow protein and and healthy things in seawater. We should be all over that. But no, it just doesn't fit the, what we're doing here. Having you switched your hats now to marketing, now that you have, you know, you had the product out and you're growing this crop now, how do you start to think about who the the buyer is and how do you start to have those conversations and is there any education involved in getting the word out? When we built this new farm, 
I lumped, if he had a teeter totter, I weighed the team down on the sales side thinking that what we would really need to do was inform the customer and, and go out and sell. And we got, I got the teeter totter thing wrong. We actually needed to grow more, but what we've connected with customers on is that if they've never heard of it. So we basically, this we're, we're copying the model that the avocado did. I mean, that, that's, if you boil it down, I'm trying to make it sound sophisticated, but all, all we're really doing is saying, why have you ever eaten a banana? Why have you ever eaten avocado? You know, all those plants went through similar cycles. And what happened in the avocados case was, I'm going to botch this, but to paraphrase, the California Growers Association was like, hey, look, we can grow this tree fruit. At the time, you know, aguacate is the Aztec word. It means tree testicle. So you would think it has the worst marketing of all time. But <laughs> what they realized was, you know, people didn't know how to eat this thing. They didn't know when it was ripe. They didn't know what would be a fair price. And all those are true with sea beans. For, but what they did realize with it were, was that interesting chefs in San Francisco and L.A. would love to use the product. They would pair it with luxury items, and they would teach people when it was ripe how to eat it, what to pay. So there was immigration to the U.S. from Central America, and, the, and folks from Central America had eaten avocado. So there was that influence. But the avocado built on the backs of chefs, and chefs taught people how to eat them. And chefs taught them that they were luxury food in the beginning, and that if you do price, if you adjust for inflation, it would cost you $27 for one avocado back in the 1950s. Wow. And last year was the first fruit to have its own Super Bowl commercial. It's a $10 billion market. I mean, it's just a fascinating story. The thing that used to be called crazy names. And they actually tried calling it the alligator pear for a while. And that turned out not to work either. So then I went back to avocado. But anyways, we're not doing anything different. We're, we're saying chefs, we don't want to make a big margin on you. We just want you to do interesting things with this product and teach people how to eat it and when it and what to pair it with. And we let the chefs run with it. And so if you look at a certain market introduced to chefs and then you kind of build out from there. I've been uh, fascinated with all things chef related. I, I think at, at some point in a, in a previous life, I, I wanted to be a chef. I remember baking and cooking when I was younger. But uh, so I love Chef's Table, the, the Netflix show. And, and they always have these episodes where they focus on local you know chefs doing local thing interesting things and, and reintroducing the restaurant owners and the local chefs to native you know plants and native you know things that are found in their own backyard and reacquainting not only you know themselves like the chefs but also their clientele and it sounds like that's something that you're doing like hey if you want to like support local and let you know folks in South Carolina know like, Hey, this is, this is something from your own backyard and which with a rich history, sure. I think that's really what I find fascinating. There's an American guy named David Fairchild and he's kind of the reason any of us have ever tried a kiwi or a watermelon. He was tasked by the USDA to go out and find interesting things. I mean, he was walking through the jungles of Chile and saw the first water, first Westerner to see a watermelon. Wow. So, but I have a friend at MUSC named George Hanna, and he thinks that, like you just said, we're in this era where we're going from David Fairchild's model, which is let's eat everything we can from other countries, back to let's see what grows around us and mm -hmm. let's eat that. And uh, over the next century, maybe we'll be eating a lot more native plants. I wanted to circle back about your conversation about or your comment about building the team. So if you had to do it all over again, how would you you know, rethink the scale and the skill set that you would bring on for your needs? That's a good question. You know, it depends on if money is is accounted, you know, is that in like an infinite money situation or? Yeah, let's say you, you do get the funding you need and you want to build out a, a dream team. Now knowing what you know, you know, what you learned in the hard way, how would you rethink how you, you would want to grow the team? You know, I do what probably Nate Story and those guys did better, which is one of the guys that helped build the farm. His name's Josh Oxner. He uh, is a, one of the hardest worker working people I've ever seen. And he came in one day and was like, what the hell are you doing? Excuse me. He was like, you know, why do you have three people on marketing and sales? And at the time I thought, duh, you need to. But now I realize if we had rebuilt the team from the beginning, it would be plant scientist, engineer, computer scientist, plumtrician, plumtrician, plumtrician. Yeah, that's going to be helpful for folks that are just getting started. So thanks for sharing that. And pest management. I oh. should add that in. Can you explain more or talk more about that? Yeah, I mean, we have an ozone machine. So we are, I can't say 
anything if you don't have an Ozo machine, go get one. That, that's what I would say to any listener who doesn't have one. They, they really help out a lot. But anyways, pest management is an area that can just absolutely crush you. You know, if, if you've scaled up a farm and you're just rocking and rolling and, and then Pythium comes through and you don't really know, or one of these root-borne pathogens, they can wipe out a whole farm and you don't even know it. You don't even see it happening. So that hasn't happened to us at this farm yet, but it's happened to me in the laboratory. It's happened to me at the last farm. So it's worth your investment to have someone on the team with a little bit of IPM, uh, with a little bit of pest management. It's interesting because uh, one of the things, or one of the selling points, if you will, or, or people describe as the advantages of indoor, indoor agricultural farming is no need for pesticides because there's no pests coming in from, from, from that aspect. But I think what you're talking about is just, is that just a, a function of what you're growing and how you're growing it? Or do you think that's, that's applicable across all crops yeah indoor oh gosh no it's it's industry wide i mean every head grower at the companies you've you've interviewed will know will probably shudder if you say the words pythium or phytophthora or fungus gnat i mean it is a function of the water it's a function of you know these systems they're not like a fine wine like they don't indoor ag doesn't get your grow room doesn't get better across time. You know, you might get better results by fixing the parameters, but I'm saying the actual inner workings of it, entropy takes over immediately from the day you can finish building it. And it starts to, you know, maintenance is key. If you haven't checked every box every week or every day in cleanliness, you, something's going to pop up. And, and uh, the, the, so they're right. You don't need pesticides in the same way. You may, you, know, you might not have aphids, but you have maybe something in the root zone that's microscopic. That's helpful. Thanks for sharing that. I noticed some work that you're doing to sort of get the word out and the visibility for the brand. Can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing with uh, Dale Sophia, if I pronounce that correctly, and what that initiative is about? Well, they they have a delicious product and they took a chance on us, you know, before we had, like right as we launched this new facility and, and uh, the owners of Acquaintance and, and uh, what they're getting the word out for and what we've been working on a little bit is to help the marsh restoration efforts. And so if you, even on the back of a napkin without a calculator, you can determine that the indoor, our indoor facility emits more carbon dioxide than it sequesters. And that's, that's just, I know plenty use, and a lot of these folks use options from the grid, which are solar or wind based, but that's, that's not an option in the South. So we emit more carbon dioxide than we sequester. So anyways, we replant marsh every spring to offset those emissions and let nature go out and scale. And so what we were thinking is, well, gosh, if we can get halfway decent at replanting marsh and it, if it's helping our bottom line because people are more willing to become regular customers knowing that they're benefiting the marsh, what if it benefits somebody else's bottom line? And so we pitched this idea with Dolly Sophia, like, hey, put our logo on your can and we'll replant a square foot every time you sell one of these cans. And within three weeks, it was his best-selling SKU. And so oh. that set us up now for a few other collaborations, one with a sunglass company, one with a uh, sea salt company. And so basically what they're doing is putting the logo on there and we'll replant marsh for them and have a very small margin on it. And so it's win-win for the planet and both companies if it helps their sales. I'm writing a this is, this is called a, uh, I'm writing a paper on it right now. It's a, it's called a, a willingness to pay or a conjoint analysis. You basically, you give a bunch of people a survey and you, in my case, I'm writing about sunglasses. So these people will be surveying about sunglasses and they will say, we will measure their willingness to pay with, if they want their sunglasses polarized, floating, biodegradable. And if you replant the environment for each sunglass you purchase. All those other variables are dummy variables and they won't change, but we will be able to record or measure their willingness to pay a premium on sunglasses that rebuild the environment. And so we see that Coors Light, for example, just came out with a beer that restores 500 gallons for every beer or every case. Patagonia came out with a beer recently that replants a tree for every six pack. You know, Ecosia replants a tree every time you search through their search engine. So I think we're going to see that absolutely blow up in this century and rightfully so if if we can team capitalism up with restoration then we're gonna this planet's gonna like overflow with biodiversity 
That's fascinating. And Deli Sophia, we'll make sure to include a link to them as well. They're a kombucha company, yeah. right? Yeah. So a couple of questions as, as we wrap up. This has been fascinating, by the way, because it's, you know, when I think, you know, when you think vertical farming, you first start down this road, you know, you, you start with your leafy greens and I've had, you know, people growing mushrooms and insects yeah. <laughs> for, for feed and, and a whole range of, of different topics. How have you grown as a, as a first time CEO since starting and, and from what you've learned now? Oh boy. When we built this farm and when the first idea was on paper, it was all about, here's the original, here's the original logo. I, this is a textbook I had. Can to, you hold that up? I'm going to take a screenshot. Yeah, sure. if you don't mind. <laughs> this is a textbook I really love about from the 1950s on uh, petroleum geography. But okay. anyways, when I first had the idea and when we were first building out this farm, it was like sales, plant science and manufacturing. Let's put all these three together and I'll be a great, I'll try and learn all everything I can. It turned out what really I need to work on the most is HR and just being able to communicate with the team effectively and be there for them and also not put too much pressure on myself. You know, I, I want this to work. It's my my baby. And and uh, so I'm learning as, as I go. I'm uh, trying to figure it out. I, luckily, that's that what we talked about in the beginning about good mentors help a lot and good employees because they'll just be like, Sam, what in the world? You know, so that they'll, they'll, they'll hold me accountable. And so, yeah, I'd say HR has been the, the biggest challenge, but it's, this has been so cool. I mean, this morning, our, our biggest customer called and the, the whole room kind of went silent because they're like, they're a very large percentage of our business. And they called and we were watching us. So Andre is our lead sales guy. So we're, you know, we're waiting to see what, his expression and and he comes and he just like lights up and comes into the next room he's like they're selling out every week and so you know that makes it all worth it even though we've had a crazy week otherwise so it's it's been cool i'm, I'm trying to learn and uh making most a lot of rookie mistakes as i go but what do you look most looking forward to as things start to open up hopefully you know towards the latter half of this year well, in my personal life, I'm, I can't wait for pickup basketball to start back up again. <laughs> I just, I can't play one on one with my quarantine buddy anymore. I, I love him, but can't do it. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that and just like shaking a stranger's hand, you know, like to meet somebody. That's always, I miss that. It's very strange to meet someone yeah. face to face. And by the way, half the South doesn't care or realize there's a pandemic going on. So if you were to go down King Street, which is our main party street, uh, you will be like you wouldn't realize there's a pandemic but i'm excited for the restaurants to be booming again that's so much of the charleston economy and there are so many of my friends who are out of work because their restaurants aren't at capacity or even open and it is a damn shame really and it's for good reason but i cannot wait to see this bustling again yeah that's been the impacts on multiple fronts obviously and and then just a single one out the restaurant and industry obviously decimated by what's been happening recently. So I think it'll, everyone in that industry is looking forward to the time when, you know, we, we can get some semblance of normalcy <laughs> in terms of like just hanging out and, and having a bite with friends and just some of the things. It's funny. It's like some of the Definitely. things we used to take for granted, you know, just being able to like hug a stranger and just, <laughs> you know, like a, share a meal with someone in public or go to the, or yeah. go to the bar and have a drink, you know, just like yeah. all those little things. I think yeah, uh, I agree. Probably missing. What's the tough question you've had to ask yourself recently? Probably, am I being a good leader? Am I, you know, that's probably, I am trying to be the best leader I can be, but I don't think I'm always, right now I'm asking myself, and I've been asking myself that a lot recently. And so I think there's a little bit of, of a fluctuation to it, you know, I, I, but hopefully I'm able each week to kind of look back and, figure out. But no, I think that's what I've been asking myself recently is, am I being a good enough manager with the with the experience that I've got so far? And I'm trying to work on it. Well, Sam, this has been a, a very interesting conversation, wide ranging <laughs> as well. So uh, I know we had some technical difficulties in the beginning, but I'm glad we were able to make it happen. And uh, I'm just glad I got to learn more about what, what you're working on. And, you know, congratulations on everything you've done so far with Aaron, progress you're making and the awareness you're bringing to just an, a niche aspect of a niche industry, <laughs> you know, that a lot of people may not know about. And uh, I appreciate you sharing your story today. Yeah, of course, Harry, thank you. It means a lot to be to 
your podcast has a lot of people that I've been watching on YouTube for five years. So that it means a lot to be just be talking to you. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Thank you. Where's the best place for folks to learn more about Heron and to connect with you? The website's fine or our Instagram is fine. They're just I have access to the Instagram, although I'm not very savvy. They can just message it and uh, Kate or I will see it. And uh, yeah, that's the best. That, those are the best channels. And I have LinkedIn now. I, I have that now. Okay. We'll make sure we have. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It was, it was fascinating about LinkedIn, specifically for like the vertical farming industries. I've connected with so many people. I had a couple of conversations of new people coming in, connecting with me today. And I always ask people like, oh, why are we connecting? How'd you find me? And, and they mentioned the podcast and they've, you know, a couple of people who are like looking for jobs in the industry have been using the episodes as a way to like learn more about the business. So it's been really exciting to see the community that's on LinkedIn for, around this topic. It's been really fun to have those conversations. Yeah. LinkedIn has showed me how big, but also tight knit the community is. I had no idea so many of these CI, CEA companies existed yeah. and it's just fascinating to learn about what each of them are working on. Yeah. So we'll be sure to uh, yeah stay connected. Excited to share your story with our audience. Thanks, sir. So thanks again to Sam for that fascinating conversation about the world of indoor agriculture, specifically sea beans, something I didn't know much about. There was so many paths I was excited to go down. The fact that he had traveled uh, to Bangladesh and, and seen how salt water crops are raised there, bringing those findings back here to the States, challenges working with seawater, fresh perspective on the importance of managing pests related to indoor agriculture and vertical farming, which was enlightening for me. So love his interest in sharing all the growing pains that have been happening with Heron Farms, the the work they're doing with some of these brands to help rebuild salt marshes. So many good things. I'd love to hear what one of your highlights was from this conversation. So please let us know. We're active on all the socials. Full show notes available at verticalfarmingpodcast.com. Special thanks to our episode sponsor, Series Greenhouse Solutions. Series creates sustainable growing environments by combining smart design, innovative technology, and dynamic partnerships. Learn more at seriesgs.com. That's C E R E S G S.com. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. Sign up for a free podcast brainstorm at fullcast.co forward slash chat 15. Tune in next week for my conversation with Sefer Musavi, co-founder of Sui Green. And as always, if you're enjoying the show, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. We'll be sure to read these out on future episodes. Until we meet again next week, here's to your health. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned in the episode, as well as a full show transcription, visit verticalfarmingpodcast.com. There, you can sign up for our email list to be notified when new episodes are published.